Jukwood Ikoe, she's Director of Policy and Advocacy, and I'm going to be moderating today. Um, but first, just a, a few notes to, to introduce um, with. So this is one of the few side, official side events on fashion at COP28, um, which itself, it's great for us, because then we get more of your attention, but it's also very alarming considering the fact that the fashion industry occupies such a central space in so many different interconnected issues, whether it's worker rights, decarbonisation, fossil fuel reliance, etc. The industry as a whole, although data is very, very uh, unreliable, um, is the equivalent of, the, of more than the global aviation industry, and yet there is so much more attention on those kind of industries. So it's really fantastic to be able to convene this panel today, and particular, particularly to have such a strong focus on garment workers and a just transition, because the fashion industry, more than any other, is a people-centered industry. It, you know, supply chains are made of people and, and not machines. Um, but it also is also an industry that is heavily, heavily reliant on fossil fuels, both in terms of energy and in terms of materials. So I head up a campaign called the Fossil Fuel Fashion Campaign, uh, EcoAge, um, and have done several years' worth of research on looking into that reliance on, on fossil fuels from the industry. Um, you know, a lot of people are unaware of the fact that most of us are wearing oil and gas every day in the form of synthetic materials, but also that whether natural or synthetic, most materials, most garments and footwear are made with fossil fuels within the supply chain. And so to, uh, you know, this sprint down the runway, to use a fashion term that we've got to do by 2030 in order to um, massively decarbonize the industry in terms of materials and in terms of supply chain emissions has to be led by people within the supply chain and not leave them behind. So we're here to discuss just that, what a just transition in um, the fashion supply chain looks like with our panel of experts here. And we will kick off with a uh, presentation from Fashion Re Revolution from Delphine Williot. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Delphine Williot. I'm the policy and campaigns manager for Fashion Revolution. We're the world's largest activism movement within the fashion, trans within the fashion industry. Um, I just wanted to kick off this session by talking about our annual research called the Fashion Transparency Index, which reviews and ranks 250 of the world's largest brands and retailers, looking, what, looking at what they disclose on their human rights and environmental policies, practices, and impacts. So if you would like more information about our research, feel free to scan the QR code. So um, what is the impact of our report? So ultimately, we are pushing for transparency, not just for transparency's sake, but because we know that transparency leads to more accountability. So a clear example of that is that when we started our research in 2017, very few brands um, were actually publishing their suppliers lists. And without this information in the public domain, we can't actually know what is happening in factories that brands are working with. Um, and just as you can see, um, now we can see that more and more brands are disclosing their first tier manufacturers, processing facilities, and raw material facilities as well. We went from not a single brand disclosing their raw material um, facilities to now having 12% of the 250 brands that we review publishing this information in the public domain. And we can see a similar trend across the board as well. What does that enable? Ultimately, publishing your suppliers list in the public domain means that civil society organizations can also cross-check where brands are operating and then cross-check what is actually happening in those factories. So we really say that our report is ultimately used to charge your activism. So to start off this session, just a few uh, important findings from our research is that while we know overproduction is a huge issue um, in in the fashion industry, we can't actually know how much is being currently produced by fashion brands because 88% of the brands that we review do not disclose the volume output. So again, we know that there's huge issues of waste. We know that there's huge consumption across the board, but we don't know how much brands are actually producing currently. Another relevant indicator for this session is looking at energy and specifically understanding how brands are going to reach their decarbonization target. But currently, as you can see, 94% um, of the major brands and retailers that we look at do not disclose what fuel is currently used uh, to manufacture their clothes. What does that tell us? That means that if a brand has a decarbonization target but is not able to tell you what is their fuel mix across their supply chain, how can we actually reach those decarbonization targets across scope three? 
And lastly, um, living wage, we believe that there is no sustainable fashion without fair pay. And again, we find very little data regarding um, how much garment workers are actually paid across supply chain and whether they're paid or not a living wage. We cannot move towards a just transition without including workers and ensuring that workers are paid fairly. And yet 99% of the brands that we review do not disclose information regarding how many garment workers in their supply chain are actually paid a living wage. And that for us is again a crucial issue that needs to be addressed. And I'll now pass on to Trina from the ISC to do her presentation. Thank you, Delphine, so much. Well, thank you all for being here. We're really excited to share our work. We have a great group of NGOs here with us. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Institute for Sustainable Communities. We ha are active globally. Right now, we have active programs throughout Asia and the United States, and our mission is to accelerate equitable climate change solutions. So we work on resiliency, mitigation, and adaptation with very human-centered approaches. And so we do this by working with local communities. When we enter communities, we do a needs once assessment to understand their needs. Oftentimes they know the solutions to the impacts of climate change that they're suffering. And so we provide technical assistance and capacity building in order to realize those solutions. So to tell you a bit about our work, it's 100% anchored in communities. That is the foci of all of the work that we do. And then the sector focus we have is access to affordable and clean energy, the built environment, and then the supply chain work that I'll tell you more about. So I'll go country by country just to give you some examples, some snapshots. In Bangladesh, we've had environmental health and safety academies. We've been there since 2010. So not only looking at compliance issues like fire evacuation and how to handle hazardous chemicals, but also mental health, the rights of women, the rights of migrant workers. So we've been doing this since 2010. And then we've expanded that portfolio of work. Recently in India, we did work with smallholder cotton farmers. Uh, India is the largest exporter of cotton in the world. However, it's very water inefficient to grow cotton in India. So we worked with the smallholder farmers in how to do so in a way that was less water intensive. It also reduced GHG emissions. It increased the soil health and also the yields. And while doing that, we worked with self-help groups, which are working working with women smallholder cotton farmers, and by selling the biopesticides and biofertilizers, they increased their revenue generation by 4,000 US dollars in the summer of 2021, so the height of COVID as well. So this is really changing livelihoods and lives. Another piece of work we do that's in the supply chain of the fashion industry, also in India, is working with micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in the manufacturing sector. And there we have twin goals of decarbonization and gender equality as well, meaning in every role in the factory or in the manufacturing site that there's women participation in decision-making roles, operating heavy machinery, engineering. And so we do this all the way looking at from the education pipeline to get them there, but then also in the manufacturing setting, how is gender equality being achieved and, and nurtured? In the Mekong region, we've worked in Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, also in the factories of big brands. I have some of them listed here, where we do decarbonization projects, putting in solar panels. We do a lot of energy efficiency. We do a lot of trainings on that. We also work on gender equality and the rights of migrant workers. This is steering a little bit away from the decarbonization work in the supply chain of the manufacturing sector, but just wanted to give you another example of how we center equity and decarbonization goals. We've done city decarbonization roadmaps in China, but really centering the perspective of the urban poor. So from that, we developed the social impact assessment tool, really rating cities and decarbonization roadmaps on six social dimensions that are very relevant to the lives and livelihoods of the urban poor, access to green space, access to public transportation, et cetera. 
And this just gives you a snapshot of some of our workers. I'll leave it there, but really looking forward to the conversation on equitable supply chains in the fashion industry. Thank you. Thank you, Trina. Um, so we'll now um, dive into the panel. Um, as you see our, our panelists here, we've got two panelists online as well. So I wanted to just kick it off um, with the panel uh, both in, in the room and online with a simple question. Um, what is a just transition and how is it connected to fashion supply chain? When you start, if you could just introduce your name and where you work, um, Liv. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. So my name is Liv Simpliciano and I am the policy and research manager at Fashion Revolution. So what is a just transition? So garment workers' time, coupled with poverty pay, subsidizes the cheap prices consumers pay, whilst major fashion brands retain maximum profits and externalize their emissions in garment-producing countries. Just transition is about a fair, equitable phase-out of fossil fuels that must put at the forefront the most marginalized individuals across the supply chain. It is about course correction, Justice in dismantling the status quo of the fashion industry and breaking cycles of abusive power, imba power imbalances. Human rights are not for sale. Root causes of inequity must be addressed to enable meaningful climate action. Solutions must be informed by affected stakeholders who hold important context to enable equitable decision making. Um, and I'll pass it on to my next panelist. <laughs> Well, I already got the stage for a bit, so I'll keep it brief, but basically a just transition is centering the human-centered approach for decarbonization. So really, the rights and the agencies of workers, we work with the factories, in the factories, in the regions, so really working with, from their perspective on what equitable decarbonization solutions are. And if we, Ruth, if we just go online for Saqib first. Saqib, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, my name is Sagib Shilan. Uh, I'm just working in a vertical integration supply textile company. It's one of the leading textile companies in Pakistan. And uh, here we are in responsible for the sustainable business practices, and we have done some remarkable things I will show you uh, later on. And then um, uh, we are also ensuring some of the sustainable initiative in the company to um, decarbonize our supply chain and also the factory at the moment. Great, thanks, Saqib. And, and what is a just transition and how is it connected to fashion supply chains in a, in a couple of sentences from you? Yeah, it's, it's very important for everyone at the moment because uh, it's a collaborative challenge for everyone. And uh, it's, uh, if, if we want to stay in a global market, we have to comply with the requirements. So uh, this is important for us, for also the generation to come. And then uh, um, if we are not able to fulfill the, all these requirements, it's uh, also difficult to stay in a global market. And also it's also difficult for us to um, protect our environment in future. Great, thank you so much. And uh, next, Ruth. Hi everyone, my name is Ruth McGilp and I'm the fashion campaign manager at Action Speaks Louder. Um, we're a, a not-for-profit organization working to hold corporations accountable to their climate promises and to close the do-say gap between promises and action. Um, for me, it's important to frame the just transition conversation um, in the climate crisis that we're all in. Um, some research from Business of Fashion came out the other day saying that 52% of global apparel exports are uh, from climate vulnerable regions, highly climate vulnerable regions. Um, so it's not just about the dependencies that fashion brands have on their supply chain, but also the impacts that their work is having on the local communities in that area. So when we talk about just transition, it needs to be about bringing not just the suppliers and the workers, but also the local communities around the factories that are impacted by coal burning, biomass burning, fabric waste burning, and general impacts of climate change, extreme heat, flooding, et cetera. So it's not just about switching location to somewhere with a cleaner grid, for example, but about bringing um, the supply chain along with us on the decarbonization journey. Great, so Sweeney, what is the just transition? How is it connected to fashion supply chains? Thank you so much, George. And uh, my name is Sweeney Bintari. I work for Solidaridad. Solidaridad is an international civil society organization. We work in over 50 countries and we work with smallholder farmers. So for us, a just transition is reclaiming, reclaiming sustainability. What do we mean by that? 
I think um, when, it, when in the context of smallholders, we want to bring back sustainability to the small scale holder farmer. Uh, when Trina and Delphine were presenting, they mentioned raw materials from natural resources. And when you're talking about a small scale farmer, by the time you are seeing the product you're wearing, there's a producer somewhere who has produced it. So when we say reclaiming sustainability and bringing sustainability back to its owners, we mean that worker, that farm worker, that cotton producer somewhere, uh, who, who's producing that cotton that essentially ends up as a dress you're wearing, as, as, as a coat you're wearing, and then moving on swiftly. And why we are saying we are reclaiming this part of sustainability is because our studies show that um, what comes back in terms of income for this smallholder farmer is between 4 to 7 percent once the dress is sold. Yeah? This is what comes back to the producer who has worked so hard on his farm to produce the cotton, which ends up where it is. So, and we see this as, um, as one way, as a barrier in which is preventing this farmer from adapting sustainable practices because then they are forced to take in, adapt, and, and sustainable practices to be able to meet their cost of production. This ends up now influencing the, the supply chain in one way or another. So I'll stop right there, George, because I'll probably come in to explain how then are we helping our smallholder farmers reclaim this sustainability. Great, and we'll dive into that um, a little bit later. Um, next, Rachel. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Rachel Kitchen. I'm a senior corporate climate campaigner at Stand.Earth. Stand.Earth is a primarily North American corporate climbing, climate campaigning organization pushing brands, uh, fashion brands, to, to go further, to go faster when it comes to decarbonization and fossil fuel phase out. And I mean, for me, a just transition is really about acknowledging that long-standing inequities exist and that moving forward, these need to be addressed and rights need to be respected and benefits need to be shared. And the, the issues that we're also aware of in fashion supply chains when it comes to climate and when it comes to social inequality are fundamentally interconnected. Um, as, you know, as George said earlier, the supply chain is made up of people and that means that the only way to achieve a rapid phase out of fossil fuels is by ensuring that those people are actively included, consulted, and compensated for their work. In order to ensure a just transition, brands, you know, Stand Earth feels that brands have a responsibility to actively include all impacted groups, including the manufacturers and workers, as well as local CSOs and interest groups. Thank you so much, Rachel. And finally, in the introductions, we'll go to Kim van der Verd on the line. Kim, Kim, are you with us? Oh, oh, there we go. Hello. Can you hear me? We can, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you for having me. So my name is Kim van der Weert, and I'm here today representing Transformers Foundation. And Transformers Foundation is a, um, an organization that was founded by the denim supply chain. Um, so our founders include everything, you know, everyone from cotton growers all the way through to jeans factories, cut and sew factories, mills. Um, chemical and auxiliary companies making indigo, making um, things that are used in denim laundries, um, and also machinery companies making the equipment used in denim production. So we really represent the denim supply chain. And actually, Saqib, who you heard from a moment ago from Diamond Denim, they are one of the founders of Transformers Foundation. Um, and um, our ambition really is, and this word reclaim sustainability that Bensari used really resonates with me because because, you know, our ambition or our aim really is to try and represent the perspectives of the denim supply chain on issues related to sustainability, in large part because we feel that um, the suppliers uh, that make up the denim supply chain haven't necessarily always had a seat at the table and a voice in shaping, you know, what this thing we call sustainability um, it should mean and what it should look like. And as for your question about just transition, oh, and I should say too that um, my background and entry point into this space is also as a former garment factory manager myself. So that's also very much my own uh, perspective on these issues. And um, 
as far as your question on just transition, um, I think for me, what I would say is, you know, we have this collective society-wide goal, the Paris Agreement, um, but a big part of a just transition, I think, from our perspective, and we articulate this also in our report that we released in, in November, which is available on our website if you're interested in hearing more, um, but it's an, an approach to figuring out how do we take this collective society-wide goal and translate it into sort of company-specific goals? And how do we sort of assign responsibility for that? In other words, you know, who should do how much? And um, in, in answering that question, who should do how much, we have to take equity into, into account. And I think that the sector's current approach to this who should do how much question um, doesn't take equity into account enough. Um, and specifically, what I mean by that is that you know, companies in the global north should do more. Um, and um, and I think the other point that for us would be very important from a just transition perspective is that, you know, we have to sort of look at decoupling who should do how much from who pays, because at the moment there's an assumption, I think, that because most of the work has to happen in the supply chain, that it is also the supply chain who will foot the bill for um, decarbonization, and that um, and and that actually, you know, just because the work needs to happen in a particular place or in a particular location should not mean that they're also responsible for footing the bill. And by footing the bill, I mean assuming the project risk, the credit risk, uh, you know, taking on the debt. Um, and finally, I think the other point that's really important to us is, you know, which I spoke to a moment ago, is who actually has a seat at the table in deciding, you know, what this thing we call climate action actually looks like. Because I think if you were to ask a lot of denim producers, you know, they wouldn't focus only on decarbonization, which tends to be, you know, what gets talked about in these types of settings, but they would also want to be talking about adaptation and resilience because, you know, they're operating in some of the places most vulnerable to climate change and also directly employ some of the people most vulnerable to climate change. And the fact that, um, you know, this whole conversation around climate action has become synonymous with decarbonization is, I think, symptomatic of who has had a seat at the table in terms of figuring out uh, what the sector's approach should be. Thank you so much, Kim. I think um, absolutely central to the conversation, yeah, who, who pays and, and how fast and who decides um, are three things that we're going to be talking about at this panel. And within the context of COP as well, there's been a major announcement by Bestseller and H&M for renewables um, funding in Bangladesh. And, you know, that is a pilot project and it is against the context of Shein also going towards their IPO. So we also have to keep in mind the idea about balance, you know, what are the odds we're fighting against? And I think bringing the reason we have, you know, we're so lucky, lucky with this panel is that we have suppliers in the room and people with supply chain experience. So I want to go to Saqib first. Um, you know, from your experience as a supplier, from a supplier perspective, what do you feel are the main barriers to, to actual decarbonization? Yeah, so the barrier to decarbonization from the supply perspective often revolves around the financial challenges and the disruption of the cost. In my opinion, in research, the first thing is initial capital investment because the upfront costs associated with the implementing the sustainable and low carbon technology can be substantial. Many suppliers, particularly with world regions, may lack the financial resources and make the initial, initial investments. So the, another point is linked with this, the ROI. Sometimes the project degree initiative have long-term ROI or sometimes no ROI. So the supply may hesitate to invest in if they are uncertain about the returns on investments over the long term or long term periods. So um, we need to look at the project that can have a, a actual ROI, they can support the sustainable business practices in the regions. And another point is linked with the complex supply chains. Uh, since we are vertically integrated, so we have uh, hundreds of suppliers who are engaged family to buying the uh, raw materials. So the fashion supply chains are often complex and involve in numerous stakeholders. So getting the information from them to make them align according to legislation and the requirements is a bit complicated at the moment. And coordinating effort decombinations 
of course, the ambulance change can be a challenging for everyone, especially uh, since in the past only the first year was being looked after by the brands and other requirements. And but at the moment, everyone is going to ensure from where the raw material is coming from and how we are going to ensure according to the sustainability requirements. Um, another thing is the market pressures and the competition that we have now. Um, since, uh, uh, as Kim already mentioned, that we have recently launched one report and we have mentioned all the legislation that's supposed to come in future and whatever the challenge we're going to have in future, uh, that must be addressed now to overcome and also to uh, establish the proper uh, business models uh, that can work with uh, a global market. So this, this kind of pressures supplier may be concerned about the losing competitiveness and it raise the sustainable standard individually, it will be more complicated for, for everyone. So a uh, uh, level playing field is essential for everyone industry-wide initiative to regulate and can be addressed the concerns. Um, another last point from my side is the green financing. Um, limited access to the green financing options can be a hindrance to support a sustainable initiative. And government financial institutes could play a crucial role in providing such uh, accessible and affordable green financing development. I just want to give one example here. As I mentioned, we are vertically integrated and um, the requirement of the power consumption is around 15 megawatt in our premises. And we have recently had a, a 4.2 megawatt project just to ensure the decarbonation in the facility. And we spent 2 million US dollars. For getting the fund from the bank, these two million US dollars, it took six to eight months to convince the bank. And also, uh, at the same time, we have some limitation from the government because government allotted some of the fund allocations to the banks. So bank cannot go beyond that limit. So it was very difficult for us to find the bank. And luckily, we found one of them. And then we went for the 4.2 megawatt project in the same premises to ensure um, to reduce the carbon emissions. I just want to share one figure here. Um, the last year, we reduced 21% of carbon emissions in terms of the normalized value. So uh, we are willing to do, and uh, this kind of financing we are looking for, uh, this 4.2 megawatt can only cover at the moment 30% of the carbon emissions, 30% uh, of our power requirements. So we are going to extend, extend, expand it and we are expecting to have 60 to 70 mega percent of the carbon emission from the same um, same uh, same area. But the problem is who is going to pay for it as uh, the same question we are mentioning in the report. So everything is interlinked with this. And so, I think um, um, as your, pro your process and the product. Yeah. Sorry, Sakib, I was just going to jump then to because on the sustainable. If it's, if, Sorry, Saki, we've got a bit of a lag here. I don't mean to inter interrupt you. I just want to jump to um, to Ruth, actually, because when we're talking about green financing in this context, there is a lot of financing going into potentially some of the wrong solutions, and we do need to have a clear-headed view as to what, what money needs to shift into the right solutions. And uh, Ruth's in a brilliant position with Action Speaks Louder in terms of corporate campaigning and corporate accountability to really kind of call some of that out and, and to hopefully help the industry to course correct and open up green financing for the right kind of solutions. Yeah, thanks, George. So, um, firstly, we have to keep remembering that it's not just what fabrics are made from, but how they're made. And it's not necessarily a, a false solution to be focusing on sustainable materials, but we need to look at where the impacts are and put our effort and our financing into supporting suppliers to reduce the impacts where they're felt most, which in the majority of cases is in tier two material processing. Um, in terms of false solutions that we see brands putting, um, putting their bets on in order to reduce their emissions, a, a huge problem is the reliance on RECs, renewable energy credits and carbon offsetting. And the problem with both of these, um, I would deem false solutions is it's flawed accounting because as you know, the, the general COP conference is reminding us, we need to triple renewable energy capacity by 2030 in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. The only way we're gonna get there is if corporates that have a huge energy d demand are procuring additional renewable energy and sending signals to the market that will, that will help us all, the entire world, have more renewables, not just one brand. Um, so we need corporates to support genuine 
uh, additionality through, for example, on-site generation through solar panels, for example, but also through corporate PPAs where they're available, um, larger scale um, generation projects, like you mentioned the, the wind project in Bangladesh that's just been announced, and also using their power, especially in countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, where um, apparel exports uh, represent a large part of the economy to, to push for policy that enables PPAs, that enables cleaner grids. And in some factories, you know, there are even limits on on-site generation because of these policy barriers. So in terms of who pays, we are calling for the brands to, to foot the bill for this. Um, we obviously want them to use those solutions that are already uh, available. Um, but also to push for the ones that aren't available yet. So rather than sitting back and waiting for policy to take a hold and using those false solutions in the meantime, um, we need them to be calling for governments in those sourcing countries to support them. Um, ultimately, you know, we, we can't take um, brands' renewable energy claims seriously if they are reliant on RECs, carbon offsets, in many cases unsustainable biomass, we, we really need um, genuine additionality from solar and wind because that's the only way that we as a whole planet are gonna reach our climate targets. So as well as you know, there not necessarily being enough money um, that suppliers have to reach their targets, some of that money is being directed into the wrong directions. Um, we, we really need brands to step up here. We need them to pool together their finances, create joint funds. Um, and yeah, as, as Saqib was saying, you know, create sustainable green financing that actually allows um, it to be less of a risk for suppliers to invest in projects that might not even meet their entire energy demand. So yeah, that's what I'd say in terms of um, false solutions is we need to look at the accounting and what's actually accounting for additional renewable energy. And I think that a really interesting point there on advocacy as well, because this is something that um, I drone on about the whole time in terms of sustainability as usual and voluntary sustainability versus changing the rules of the game and working on policy. If you're a brand who talks about sustainability, whatever se sector you're in, you need to be ensuring that that is codified. And I know Rachel and at, at Standard Earth with their fashion, fashion scorecard, fossil-free scorecard, um, sorry, so many fossil fashion, fossil-free, all sorts of S flying around. Um, amazing work if you haven't checked it out already, but they also assess brands on their level of advocacy. Um, and so I'd love to get your opinion as well, Rachel, on, on this similar question around false solutions and also where does the finance need to come in and looking at that advocacy question too. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, um, so as George mentioned, so Stand or Earth, we research and publish the Fossil Free Fashion Scorecard, which is a benchmark for, um, for real meaningful action to cut emissions and to phase out fossil fuels and supply chain. So we're not really measuring so much what they say, we're trying to set a benchmark for what is actually happening in supply chains. And we really emphasize in that report the need for finance, for supplier engagement, uh, and, and effective advocacy to support a transition to clean renewable energy. We know that renewable energy is overall the number one most important way to cut emissions in fashions, uh, in fashions, the fashion sector supply chain. So it's, it's a hugely important element and one where brands have a huge role to play. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, in developing and researching the, the scorecard, I personally spent a huge amount of time going through brands' uh, sustainability reporting, impact reporting. So we do get a sense of kind of emerging false solutions or emerging narratives that are coming through. And, um, and I, I would say that one that we have seen coming in the last couple of years is part of the push, the really important push to phase out on-site coal burning in tier two, particularly uh, manufacturing. And that's really through brands promoting the use of biomass burning as an alternative to coal. And Stand, along with kind of other CSOs in the environmental and human rights community, believe that biomass should not be treated as a renewable energy source. Uh, the number one source of biomass is wood pellets, has a significant impact on deforestation. And the increased use of biomass boilers at any kind of scale can pose a threat to the climate, to ecosystems, and to human health, as biomass burning has significant emissions and significant air pollution impacts, as well as uh, potentially impacts on land, water, and other resources. 
And we're also concerned that a shift towards biomass boilers, which have a lifespan of 20 or 30 years, ultimately threatens that necessary onward transition to electrification, to clean renewable energy. Um, and we believe that brands you know, in this space, if they're considering um, biomass, have a responsibility to prove that due diligence has been respected and that they must disclose a robust plan for transitioning to renewable energy and beyond burning. And I think that this is where this, this investment is being misdirected. You know, we, there's potentially huge investment, capital investment, going into buying biomass boilers, which are then in place for a very long time. So, um, you know, when, what we need to see from the sector is... Um, from brands is investment in those long-term decarbonization solutions and not just kind of a quick fix which will reduce your scope three number but ultimately can have potentially harmful impacts. Um, so brands should really be investing in transitioning the supply chain towards electrification, uh, towards energy efficiency, so investing that money in clean processes um, and, and as well as kind of in the long term supporting the greening of electricity supply through that advocacy, through that direct investment that we're seeing coming, coming through this H&M bestseller um, announcement. And, um, you know, yeah, to answer your question around advocacy, advocacy is one of our criteria in the scorecard. And there are a few brands really leading on the question of advocacy and many, many more who are stepping back and allowing those, those leaders to really take uh, take their voices and, and be the one, the only ones kind of present in the space. We need many more brands to accept that they have, they have a voice, they have power, purchasing power and real kind of potential to impact policy in a positive way and for them to, to really to use their voice and engage more actively in that space. And I want to um, go to Kim online um, because I know you have a slightly... Um, uh, different opinion um, in terms of who <laughs> should be responsible and who should be paying for decarbonization? Sure. Um, okay, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Um, so I guess what I would what I would say is that you know in terms of false solutions, one of the things that came out very strongly in the research for our report that I mentioned in the introduction is that um, you know, we need to be looking at where the, we call it, we refer to it in the report as sort of the opportunity space. Where's the opportunity space for reducing emissions? And what we heard very strongly from the denim suppliers that we spoke to in doing the research for that report is that the opportunity space is very, very contextual. And, um, and uh, just because the emissions are, you know, the bulk of the emissions are in a given part of the supply chain, say, the mills uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's where the opportunity space is. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And you know what? What, what the denim suppliers that we spoke to shared with us was that there are so many contextual layers that impact this opportunity space. You know, are they operating in a place where they have access to renewables through the grid? Well, in most denim production countries, no, they don't have very much access to renewables through the grid. So if they don't have access to renewables through the grid, are they able to generate their own sources of renewable electricity? And here I speak only about electricity. Um, and here as well, there are different sort of um, contextual factors that would shape that opportunity space. You know, how much space do they have for solar panels? You know, um, we talked to some people who had looked at setting up, you know, wind farms, you know, what were the building codes in the places where they were operating? And, you know, was that actually possible? How much sunlight are they getting in a, in a given, in a given day? Um, because that also is, is, uh, highly contextual. Um, and then, you know, what we also heard and Saqib spoke to this as well, you know, some of them were in places where they could set up power purchase agreements. Some of them were not, um, uh, uh, if they were not able to renew, uh, to generate their own renewable sources, sources of electricity, this would 
would be maybe one of the options or levers that they might have. And the you know, extent to which that was available was also highly contextual. But also, you know, from an optimization perspective, not only looking at, you know, switching to renewable energy sources, but just using less. Here too, what people said to us is that there's sort of a perception that this is a supplier's private business. But in fact, what many of the denim suppliers that we spoke to said to us was that even things like, you know, the availability of the engineering skills, the mechanical engineering skills in a country impact the extent to which you might be able to optimize your sources or, you know, duty rates um, and the cost of importing better machinery, you know? Um, and so they, they sort of, what we kind of, how I would describe it is what we heard was sort of layer upon layer of contextual factors that impact this opportunity space. And what that means is that really what we need to be doing, I think, is instead of looking at sort of a one size fits all approach or looking at sort of, you know, blanket uh, statements or positions or solutions, we need to be looking at what makes sense in a given location, um, given what's possible and what's feasible for that producer, you know, in that, in that not only location, but at that tier. Um, and that, um, you know, just to respond briefly to the to the to the biomass point, what we heard from a lot of suppliers, especially mills, was that, you know, depending on their total energy requirements, electric boilers technically may not even be a viable option for them. And that's assuming then that the source of the electricity to fuel that electric boiler is also renewable. And so I think these are some, some of the kinds of questions that just indicate the importance of looking at context and looking at sort of which levers make sense in which places, um, because I don't think we can take sort of a blanket approach to that. Um, and um, what I would also say, just to respond on the financing piece, some of the false solutions we have there is one of the things that we heard very strongly from the denim supply suppliers that we spoke to was that there's kind of like this narrative that if they just tried harder or cared more that they would be able to find a way to to to, to make these things these investments pay off for themselves, you know? And um, as Saqib said, uh, what we heard very loud and clear from the suppliers that we spoke to is that there's kind of two funding needs that uh, need to be met if we talk about reducing emissions. And they said, yes, you know, there are investments that can be made that do generate returns, um, but many of these investments are not getting made because there are barriers in terms of accessibility to finance, availability of finance. You know, is there just enough money out there to fund these things? And also the affordability um, of, 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 of the financing. And that could be, you know, uh, about, you know, for example, having to borrow in hard currency, which is too risky, but it could also be, you know, related to price and whether or not they think that they'll be able to secure a higher price to sort of pay off that that investment. And the second funding need that was identified um, by the suppliers that we spoke to was, um, as Saqib pointed out, that there are certain projects um, that simply do not have a return on investment or have an extremely long payback period. And um, here too, there are, I mean, this is, and, and what they felt was that this is not generally acknowledged or understood in the sector, um, and that they're expected to sort of take on debt for these projects, which really are not investments, but just expenses. And, um, and so I think the, the last thing I think to emphasize here is this is not only a CapEx problem, so a matter of securing the upfront investment, it is also an OpEx problem because many of these solutions also increase a factory's operating expense uh, expenses. And that means that in a, you know even if a factory might be able to um, secure the upfront financing that they need, um, if it increases your operating expenses, you also need a higher price to be able to, to, to cover that additional expense. And so, um, you know, there are a number of solutions out there that, you know, like there's, uh, you, you, you know, is including things that have been announced this week, which are certainly important pieces of the puzzle. But I think that from our perspective, the point that we would emphasize is that, you know, we have to also, in addition to the solutions that we have out there, be looking beyond debt. We have to be looking at solutions that address both of these funding needs. We have to be talking about this both as a CapEx and an OpEx issue. And we have to sort of let go of this, I think, implicit belief that we hold, which is that these that all of these investments are going to uh, make a factory money, and that's therefore, you know, why wouldn't they do them? 
Thank you, Kim. And I think um, you know we've got a, a picture here of just how complicated it is from a supplier perspective. It's so context specific, and it needs such a level of engagement, as you said, that's informed and even led by suppliers, and then hopefully paid for by the brands. And then in terms of that kind of transparency and accountability piece, piece obviously Fashion Revolution are leading the charge in this with their Fashion Transparency Index, amazing research, um, and also holding brands to account. And yeah, I'd just like live you to give you an opportunity to talk about that a bit. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, I feel like this is gonna be a, a break in the programming, a commercial break, just to talk <laughs> and address about the root causes and power imbalances um, in the fashion industry. So for me, uh, accountable, meaningful transparency helps to address the root causes of injustice, inequity, and inaction. Um, information that ultimately helps to disrupt the status quo. It is well known that brands' purchasing practices are key enablers of good working conditions in their supplier facilities. Yet brands continue to drive inequalities through unfair purchasing practices, which form the backbone of the fashion industry. Unfair purchasing practices include things like canceling and delaying orders, refusing to pay for orders, demanding discounts, sudden changes in order volumes, and paying for orders very late. Evidence continues to mount that major fashion brands engage in practices which are volatile and abusive towards their suppliers. Uh, Delphine talked a little bit about the Fashion Transparency Index earlier, but some of our findings also show that uh, major brands are working on unfair terms with their suppliers. So for example, just 12% of the 250 brands we review disclose a responsible purchasing code of conduct. You know, this industry has set really lofty targets to be net zero, which seem far into the future, but we don't have time to wait. And emissions are continuing to rise as brands' pro profits also rise. And this power imbalance forms the backbone of this industry. Suppliers need to have some reassurance and trust from their brand partners that they will not abandon them, uh, and brands must share this financial risk. So when it comes to basic transparency on how brands are performing on their climate targets, again, there is an immense lack of transparency. Um, something like uh, less than a third of the brands that we review disclose how they are progressing on their science-based targets. So aggressive actions on climate are impeded by this lack of transparency because it inhibits the true scale of the problem and it obscures where the greatest responsibility for action lies. Fashion brands, as we know, must lead the clean energy transi transition based on their pow for powerful purchasing power in their sourcing countries and le leverage this to deliver real renewable energy capacity. So at COP this week, we've uh, uh, published a list of demands for the fashion industry and for policymakers as well. So just to give you on what those demands are, we are demanding brands disclose their fuel mix by country as it enables a deeper understanding on major fashion brands' reliance on fossil fuels and where action is needed most. We are demanding to see a detailed breakdown of renewable energy procurement type, so broken down as you know the percentage coming from self-generation, purchasing pa uh, power agreements, contracts with suppliers, unbundled EACs, and passive claims. We need to see a full breakdown of how they are generating renewable electricity. So we know that globally we need to triple renewable energy capacity through largely wind and solar by 2030 and, cor and <laughs> corporate procurement needs uh, to support this genuine additionality. So transparency on brands uh, procurement strategies allows for an understanding of where greatest efforts are needed, not so that major fashion brands can move production elsewhere where renewable electricity is more available, um, but so that they can use their purchasing power to grow availability of this renewable electricity. Purchasing power is a measure of responsibility. So finally, pur purchasing practices and power to policy influence pipeline, I know that's a lot to say, um, but it's, it's really important that major fashion brands help develop the legislative ecosystem in garment producing countries uh, required to grow availability of and capacity of renewable electricity. So this is all about addressing root causes of inequity and realizing that major fashion brands have immense power and responsibility to not abandon their suppliers because of climate crisis, but recognize that their wealth and success has built on the extraction of their resources and labor and so on and so forth. So this is really about a question of justice and course correction. Thank you, Liv. Um, I think it's such an important dynamic to be aware of and the fashion industry really lays out clearer than many others this idea of extraction of resources and of kind of human workforce from the global south, hoarding of the profits and the products in the global north and then 
you know, reshipping the emissions and the pollution and, and the vast piles of waste clothing back onto the global south again. And then in terms of this kind of worker element of it and garment worker element, it's not a word we've heard that much um, from the kind of fashion sustainability core group present at COP, mostly represented by the brands. Um, I want to go to you, Sweeney, to, to expand upon the points you went to in the introduction about what this looks like for workers on the ground and how they need to be supported. Thanks, George. Uh, I think Kim has already sp spoken a bit about what this worker looks like, and I would like to just, um, she's brought in very key food for thought uh, questions that I would like to build upon. So I'll give you a case of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is one of our countries in which we operate, and we work with uh, small holder farmers, cotton producers. And you're looking at um, a, a farm worker, a producer, who is limited in terms of land. So we're already talking about very small acreage of land. But we are also bringing in issues related to low investment. So this is a farmer who essentially has low income power when it comes to it. And, and, and then now when you compound this with climate change and related aspects, you can imagine what, what kind of a worker or a producer we are talking about. So Kim was asking, one of the things she has asked is, um, is there enough money out there to even take up some of these decarbonization technologies you're talking about? And the answer in, this, in the context that I just brought out is no. There's not enough money out there. And, and, and I would agree with her that there's no one blanket solution to decarbonization in essence, but more like looking at multiple solutions that can be brought on board to actually um, make this farmer resilient, resilient enough to continue producing. Because we, we, uh, this producer is essentially at the bottom of the pyramid. So you can imagine what kind of a person you're talking about. So, so then when you now bring in the context of what is Solidaridad, for example, doing to be able to make this producer more resilient, then you'll be looking now in the context of decarbonization we, we are trying to link them to microfinance institutions to access renewable energy options in the field use. Yeah? This is the best that you can do, because this is a farmer who essentially, you come and say, adopt this, it is best for the supply chain, it is good for you, but I have no source of income, so where does that leave me? So the first instant is enable them, give them access to, to, to some financial institutions that can help them to actually pick up on this. Of course, combined with other things related like agronomic practices. So we call it a three-pronged approach because we start at the farm level and, hope, and help this farmer with the production aspects. And then move to the governance issues and that's why again I said it's not a one blanket solution kind of thing. It's a multiple of partners coming together to make this producer more resilient. So when you look at governance, then you'll be looking at how are we helping and working with trade unions, strengthening trade unions so that they're able to, um, to, to, to establish collective bargaining agreements, then they're able to voice out what's going on, then they're able to lobby for decent work, for example, yeah? So then we have issues, uh, like this farmer, when we're talking about this farmer, uh, in Ethiopia, for example, talking about a workforce of about 600,000 uh, farmers working just in the smallholder sector farmers in the cotton producing uh, value chain. So then, and this, this, this crop of workforce has so many women. So we're talking about social inclusion as well. How do you, you can talk about decent work, but when now you don't bring in the aspects that the climate change related aspect and barriers that prevent this woman from accessing these resources, then, then it beats logic. So, so essentially we look at things from that uh, perspective, who is this workforce and what are these different multiple solutions and who can we bring on board to help to make this farmer more resilient. Great, thank you so much. And then if we go then one step up the supply chain, you know, we're, we're at the farm level on you know, individual level, you know, right at the bottom of the supply chain, not to be d d dismissive about it at all, but in terms of enabling them, Trina, I'd like to go to you in terms of your work at ISC. What does that look like from a supplier perspective and, and from a brand perspective? How do they enable that decarbonization transition? Well, thank you, everyone, for the rich discussion. Um, 
So a few things. I mean, as I said, you know, we're on the ground. We're in the countries where we work, and we have very comprehensive, multi-stakeholder consultation groups that guides our work. And so up to 100 people join. We've done this in all three countries that were present in Southeast Asia to really inform what are practical solutions. Um, and so as Kim mentioned, where renewable electricity is not available, and she mentioned electricity. I mean, let's point out that boilers is thermal electricity, so that's different, thermal energy, sorry. So that's different than electricity. Um, and there's a lot of barriers on the ground, like access to that, um, to that energy. And also, um, when we're there on the ground, we see what suppliers are doing in order to be, like, be the supplier of choice by brands, because they all have their ESG goals, right? And so how are suppliers differentiating themselves? So one thing we saw was the use of biomass. There's a lot of biomass that's being used in these boilers for thermal energy. So one thing we did in our consultation stakeholder process is how do we make that more sustainable in, because there's not access to the renewable electricity on the grid and the boilers aren't electric yet. So there's that whole transformation as well. And as we've all said, the access to finance is a limiting factor. So one thing that we did is develop a sustainable biomass guideline. Um, it is born out of the region. However, it has global uh, applica applicability. And so it has five categories. It's looking at five um, indicators. And within the indicators, there's a lot more evaluation indicators. So it's looking at climate change, biodiversity loss, air pollution, human rights, and the rights of workers as well. And with that, it says, OK, what's acceptable? What's acceptable with mitigation? What's completely unacceptable? So for instance, what's completely unacceptable is any solid wood in any form. Uh, what is acceptable, for instance, is agricultural waste. And there's many layers, and accompanying with that is a risk assessment tool. So that, that can be used in different ways for suppliers that are already using biomass, those that are looking to purchase biomass, and those that don't know and just want to make a decision. And it is, there's a very local context. And what this is doing is creating agency for the factory owners, for the community workers, for the industrial associations, the worker representatives. Representatives, so they have a thorough way of assessing what can be used right now in lieu of the access of renewable electricity and renewable energy, which is what the boilers need. There's not a lot of electric boilers anywhere, let alone where these factories are, so that they can source responsibly and sustainably. And in the meantime, it's not meant to be either or or sequential, but in parallel, what is going on as far as advocacy, advocacy so there's more renewable energy and electricity available in these places in a timely manner. There's a lot of technical issues with the grid. There's a lot of permitting. There's a lot of financial issues. So all of that needs to happen simultaneously. But working on the ground with the communities, with the factory owners, to answer your question, we, we and you know, what, what the communities need are the agency because they haven't had these, the opportunity to be part of the decision making. So when they're informed with these tools, then they can make decisions that are good for the communities, the workers, the local economy, and of course also their not only greenhouse gas emissions, but the air pollutants as well. Thank you, Trina. And I think um, what I would like to move on to now, just a, a, you know, a couple of questions, and anybody feel free to jump in, um, although I'm going to go to Rachel first. And then we'll have some quick fire questions, and then we'll have Q&A, because I really want to get into, the, into that. Um, but looking at positive examples and looking at what you'd like to see more of over the next like, couple of years, out to 2030, what brands are doing at the moment, and you know, how, how we can sort of lead by example wherever you are in the fashion industry, um, and yeah, Rachel first, but anybody, please feel free to jump in. In terms of positive examples of what's actually, what's actually being done, we know what needs to be done, but what's actually being done. Yeah, I think, um, I think there are some positive examples in terms of um, what I'm seeing through the, fashion, the Fossil Free Fashion Scorecard, for example, is more brands uh, are talking about the need for an energy transition than, you know, this is <laughs> relatively new. I mean, it seems like a low bar, but it is, uh, it is progress. And I think that more brands are um, 
aware of the need to actively engage with their manufacturers, with their supply chain. Um, and I, I think that, you know, for example, uh, I was in Bangladesh recently and I, was, I met with a couple of brand representatives in country, you know, knowing that they have uh, that, uh, that, that location, that they are aware of the local context and are, are engaging in that actively is to me real progress. Um, I think that um, we are seeing, you know, more brands who are aware, for example, of the need to engage in advocacy and for their, um, that they have that option. And it's relatively new, I think, for corporations to be kind of aware of their, um, of their voice in the world and to be engaging in this. As I said earlier, like, a lot more need to do so. And I think to kind of echo a few of the points we've heard here, that when that advocacy, uh, in terms of what that advocacy looks like, brands really need to be speaking to their supply chain to understand exactly what to advocate for. Um, I think, again, from an example from Bangladesh, who we was speaking um, with a group of manufacturers who are saying, like, you know, when it comes to sourcing uh, solar panels, for example, we can, we can get the solar panels, but there's one component which has an incredibly high uh, import duty on it. And if brands could en engage in an advocacy campaign to change that, that, would that small piece, which wouldn't necessarily occur to a brand on its own, would have a significant impact. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, the, that's kind of what I'm seeing uh, in, on a macro level. Like. Any, anyone else? Good yeah. positive examples, yeah jump in on, I guess, positive examples of accountability because our action speaks louder. It's all about like this do say gap and just briefly linking back to what Liv said about purchasing practices. It kind of occurred to me, okay, the main do say gap is what brands are saying about sustainability versus what their sourcing and buying teams are pushing on suppliers mm -hmm. because we can have, there are positive examples of one-off funds, climate funds for perhaps suppliers to access or for new technologies to scale up, but one-off funds aren't enough. We also need suppliers to have higher margins in general. Um, but yeah, I want to talk a bit about accountability. So I guess in our conversations with brands, the main theme that comes across is, I guess, hiding behind certain voluntary schemes. Um, for example, RE100, SBTI, um, Sustainable Apparel Coalition, Fashion Charter, etc. And I'm, I'm not criticizing any individual scheme, but in general, they can't be a substitute for corporate accountability and, as Liv was saying, full transparency at the business level rather than at an aggregate level, which actually makes it impossible for civil society organizations like Stan, like Sol Solidaridad, like Action Speaks Louder and Fashion Revolution to hold them accountable. So what we need is legislation. We need robust legislation that mandates you know, scope through emissions reporting, emissions reduction targets, environmental due diligence, and as the Transformers Fou Foundation report um, points out very clearly, like this, this idea of supplier consultation also needs to be taken into account at that legislation level because SBTIs, for example, are, are included. Um, but um, so I'm kind of hopeful seeing developments in that space. Obviously, we've got um, this fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, lots of countries joining on and um, EcoAge's brilliant fossil fashion campaign is advocating from that from a sector level. Um, we also have, you know, various corporate accountability laws in the EU and the Fashion Act in New York, um, potentially in the next five years with these things starting to come into account. I'm hoping the landscape changes from one of voluntary compliance to, for example, certification schemes, um, multi-membership platforms that are based on voluntary um, agreements and are often funded by the brands themselves um, to one of, yeah, mandatory compliance and it being the norm that we know where brands are producing, what they're producing from, and what the impact of their production is. Um, so that's where I would like to see more positive examples rather than individual brand announcements. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> and actually, else changing, uh, changing Markets put out that great report about um, certification schemes yes, yeah. and about who marks their own homework and things. So I'd recommend if, if people are interested in this, it's quite interesting to, to map the web of um, who's setting the rules. 
yeah, as well. if anyone's interested, it's called Licensed to Greenwash, and it got us in some hot water, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, very, it's very interesting, very robust research, if I do say myself, on 12 different certification schemes and voluntary initiatives in the fashion industry, and, and how, in some cases, they do provide a kind of greenwashing smokescreen. Um, anyone else on the positive examples, what you'd like to see more of? Yeah, happy to... Sorry, Kim. Um, but happy to just quickly say something. So uh, this week, it was really great to see two major fashion brands coming together and investing in a $100 million uh, offshore wind energy project in Bangladesh. This is a very, very welcome step in the right direction, um, although it will need to go undergo some pre-analysis before it's being um, greenlit. And it's a really welcome sig sig um, signal of where the industry is going, um, but not to bring down <laughs> to a negative example, but I just, I just really hope that, you know, while major uh, fashion brands are investing this money into growing the capacity of renewable um, energy, which is absolutely needed. Um, I do wonder how brands are supporting and enabling living wages as well. You know, you can put a solar panel on top of uh, the roof of a factory, but how does that trickle down to increasing the living wages of garment workers? Um, and we know that the number one demand of garment workers worldwide, bar none, is living wages. So alongside these investments, brands need to be also enabling uh, living wages. Um, also, inequalities will continue to be perpetuated and remain unaddressed. There is no sustainable fashion without fair pay. Um, we know that there's incredible record-breaking amounts of wealth today, and one of the listed and proven policies to reduce inequality fast is ensuring living wages and trade union rights. In our research um, with the Fashion Transparency Index, whilst 85% of major fashion brands have a policy on freedom of association and collective bargaining, just three out of 250 of the brands we, re we review disclose the number of collective bargaining agreements that actually provide wages higher than required by local law for workers in their supply chains. So absolutely welcome the investment into these renewable energy projects, um, but at the same token, we also need to remember uh, very fundamentally, as George said at the beginning of this talk, is that fashion supply chains are built with people um, and they need to be earning living wages so they can send their children to school, afford um, affordable housing, go to the doctor, uh, you know, put healthy food on the table. All of this is incredibly important. And just to quickly give a shout out to Delphine who led uh, our Good Clothes Fair Pay campaign uh, this last year. Uh, we were calling for uh, mandatory living wages due diligence, and this is something we hope to continue doing, and hopefully it will be incorporated um, into law in the future. Um, this is something that we'll be continuing to campaign on, hopefully. Um, so just naming that living wages are absolutely fundamental uh, to just transition, and you know we need brands to continue to um, pay higher, well, not continue because they're not doing it yet, <laughs> but pay higher prices uh, to suppliers to really unlock the, the potential uh, for garment workers to actually earn what they deserve. And, and to afford climate resilience. Right? Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> Without yeah. living wages, how, how can people adapt to the impacts of climate change that are being felt? And I think that's a really important point that, Sweeney, you made, that this is about, you know, continuing to keep producing, which is in the interest of the brands, it's in the interest of, of people working in the supply chain. They need climate resilience to keep producing. Yeah. And, and, and I like that, George, we are seeing a more conscious customer, yeah? A customer who's now interested to know what is the impact of my purchase, yeah? And that, that, that speaks volumes because at some point, questions will be raised even like what uh, Ruth is saying, where, where is the raw material coming from? Who has produced it? How much are they gaining from it, yeah? And, 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 and the living wages issue now comes out very, very prominently. But I think what we would also like to see more in the context of um, this farm worker is that retailers, and brands go just beyond uh, purchasing 100% uh, in, in terms of cotton uh, that is coming from, uh, from just good sources, right? There are a lot of standards around that. What we'll want to see more is them putting aside a kitty, ring fence it, specifically a finance kitty that is geared towards making this farm worker adopt the sustainability practices we're talking about. Otherwise, this just goes round in circles, let them adopt, let them do this and this. But if they purposely go out of their way and say this is specifically to ensure that farm worker is able to access the right technologies, the right uh, work environment to sort of now uh, plug in into the whole su supply chain. I think that will go a long way. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to some very quick fire questions to close off the panel, and then we'll have a, a Q and A. Um, so.
who pays and how do we ensure accountability? And starting with Saqib online. Yeah, that's a very good question, who pays? And we are looking for who will pay. <laughs> At the moment, the thing is, uh, um, since it's the biggest challenge for everyone, and we got to share some of the examples that uh, for us, since I'm working in a textile company for the last 18 years, so I would say the average price of basic pipe powder is still at five to six dollars. So that is the biggest problem. Since 18 years I'm working in a textile company. But at the same time, whenever we were talking about the sustainable business practices and how we, we can produce a sustainable product, so we need to invest on a sustainable technological advancement. We need to invest on a green energy. So these investments should come from some sources. Either government should fund it, other brands should participate in Brand is saying we are a business partner. But at the same time, uh, same time, being a partner, brand is still looking for a lower cost price garment from us. And we are saying, let's go for the a sustainable business premium. Like if there's, uh, we are selling at $6, if they're ready to pay 6.2, that point to... Are you with us, Saqib? Oh, oh. you still with us, Saqib? that we can do but at the moment it's not happening and we are expecting to have this kind of a support in future as well and and such kind of a support we can also get from the government like the policy advocacy collaboration between industrial and stakeholders is also important for us at the moment uh, to engage proactive and policy advocacy to ensure the standardization for everyone we were discussing about the uh, different kind of certifications so there should be standardization for us and also the incentive program should can be introduced by the government also from the bread and from the government it can be a financial incentive tax break or subsidized for the companies adopting eco-friendly technology and this is this will not only ease the financial burden but also encourage widespread adoption of sustainable practices um, so in my perspective, these are the points and also the global collaboration is also, also very important for us at the moment, given the international nature of fashion industry. Government should actively participate in a global sustainable initiative and also to capacitate the textile industry, what is the best possibility way to produce a sustainable product and the process. Thank you so so much. Um, by addressing these areas, we can create a conducive environment for the supplier to embrace decarbonations and contribute significantly in just transitions of the fashion supply chain. Thank you so much, Saqib. Um, Liv, quick fire, who pays and how do we ensure accountability? Um, so I think it's really important. I know we've been talking about uh, major fashion brands for paying, uh, you know, for decarbonization of supply chains. This is obviously important, but they need to be working together with governments, um, you know, private, um, you know, you know, working with banks as well, and also making sure that it, when these decisions are being discussed, they include affected stakeholders at the table. I think ultimately, um, you know, there's no fashion on a dead planet, so uh, major fashion brands need to really be taking this very seriously and uh, listening to the science and really implementing robust um, transition plans and being very critically transparent about these plans so that civil society can hold them accountable. Um, and I know this doesn't exactly answer it, but just, <laughs> it's just one thing to say because I didn't get to say it before, is that uh, multi-stakeholder multi initiatives and groups must push for the regulatory climate um, that will enable brands to realize their commitments. I think that that's one of their responsibilities. They need to be helping uh, brands to raise the bar and not you know, allowing them to hide behind a safe harbor of inaction and you know, retaining the status quo. So I think all of these things together are important to um, uh, you know, realize our decarbonization targets. Sorry, I'll be quiet now. No, it's great. And <laughs> and Liv has some amazing posters, which everyone should get at the end. I personally want to hang them in my window. So, um, Trina, who pays and how do you ensure accountability? So in this cap, one thing I've observed, there's a lot of talk about blended finance. <laughs> um, there's a lot of talk of that, of concessionary finance. And there's a reason, because to hit decarbonization goals by 2030 at least, hopefully by 2050 it'll be a different conversation, 
but the private sector is not absorbing it. It's not, it's not going to work. It's not realistic. And so I think blended finance is extremely important in this case in particular. When we say brands, it's a big bucket. I mean, there's a whole spectrum of brands. Fast fashion is getting more successful. Uh, you know, we have Shine that's going to IPO in the United States in a couple of weeks. So uh, we need to be realistic about the financing sources. And in this, I don't agree with every panel that talks about blended finance, but in this case, I really do think um, that is a very practical way to pay and also concessionary as well, I'll say. Um, and accountability. I mean, as you can see, we have great NGOs that are, that'll hold us honest. And I think the consumers, Sweeney mentioned, I mean, the, the consumers have a huge part of this, which is why the private sector can't finance it right now, because the consumers aren't paying that premium, if, even if there is a premium. I mean, just the marketing, the branding. People are aware and want to know where their clothes are made and how um, it doesn't influence their purchasing decisions at the end of the day, and a lot of, there's a lot of research behind that. Thank you, Gina. Um, Kim, who pays and how do we assure accountability? Sure. So um, on the, let me start with uh, who pays. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so I think that, you know, I want to clarify because in our report, what we advocate for is a collective approach. So yes, we would like to see brands and retailers footing more of the bill, but we, you know, we're not opposed to supply people, entities in the supply chain also footing part of the bill. The issue I think is that this has to be equitable relative to the margins. And the situation that we have right now is that the, the entities with the least amount of money are the ones putting, uh, and the least a sort of share of the profit, though, the final profit, putting up the most most amount of money to fund decarbonization and that really should be the other way around and um, I think that you know what I would say too is that there are a lot of great uh, types of you know different types of solutions that have been announced this week but also you know in uh, in the last couple of months and um, I think what I would just caution is that the danger is I think when those examples are oversold as, as the golden ticket or the solution that will work for everyone and everything and that you know yes they are pieces of the puzzle but that is exactly what they are they are a piece of the puzzle and there are a lot of other pieces of this puzzle that frankly we don't have financing models for yet and actually I'm working with a group of um, seven um, uh, apparel producers not only in denim on a white paper that will come out in, in quarter one of next year, uh, looking at some of these sort of more innovative financing models for some of these other pieces of the puzzle. Um, and um, and the, on the accountability piece, um, oh, la and on the who pays, I think it, I hope it goes without saying, but I think that, you know, um, these solutions that are debt-based, they are certainly a puzzle piece, but they cannot be sort of treated as the golden ticket or the only solution. You know, suppliers cannot assume debt for, you know, f financing the sector's uh, transition. And on the accountability piece, what I would say is, I mean, I would certainly echo what Saqib said about price. And then from a legislative perspective, what I would say too is, you know, instead of, instead of focusing so much on the target setting, I think there are ways that we could hold brands accountable um, uh, Beyond, besides, you know, the emphasis on target setting, for example, one of the suppliers that we spoke to in our report said, you know, why don't we ask brands and retailers to, you know, they report on their emissions reductions in their supply chain, and why don't we ask them to differentiate or to disaggregate how much of those emissions reductions that they're claiming actually happened without any work or input from them? you know, that they're basically just claiming on behalf of their supply chain, how much of those emissions reductions happen with maybe some technical support or some other kind of support from the brand or retailer, and how much of those emissions actually um, did brands and retailers support to finance um, and invest in financially, and that there are ways that we could, you know, hold brands and retailers accountable for their work in supporting um, their supply chain's transitions by sort of just, I think, changing a little bit what we require them uh, to report on. And my final thing, I'll be very quick, is that I think at a very high level, what I would also like to see from brands and retailers is to, to have the humility to stop prescribing solutions um, and really thinking, uh, uh, listening to your supply chains, which probably also requires a sort of rethink of how our supply chains are structured uh, in the first place. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, in the interest of time, because we've, we've, I think we've well and truly answered those two questions, um, I'd love to open the floor to um, any Q&A. We've got 10 minutes. 
Right, so you first, um, so I'll take you and, and you. My name is Leticia, I'm from Brazil. Um, when we talk about fashion, I think we also have to talk about reduction because we live on a planet with finite resources. So decarbonization is just one pillar of sustainability. So what is your take on reuse, recycling? Uh, what should we be doing to take those to the mainstream uh, and uh, balancing these with production? And also, so how do we address overconsumption in that way? And what is your take on price? Because I also believe that overconsumption is a result of the uh, cheap price of clothes, uh, which are entangled with all these uh, social problems. So I'd like to hear a little bit on that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and this lady in the front, who asked your question. Oh, should I ask you right Yeah, now? ask him. We'll, we'll okay, roll into one. Okay, it kind of ties along with yours. Um, how much do you think that we should transition um, fashion into evolving more into a circular economy rather than revamping the supply chain to add the production of new clothes, which is the mix of those solutions? Amazing. Um, I mean, I can answer very quickly just uh, from my perspective, and one of the things I didn't say in the introduction is... One of the reasons we focus on fossil fuels in materials is because not only does it have a large carbon footprint in terms of upstream, but downstream it causes huge problems as well in terms of um, recyclability. Synthetic fibers are practically unrecyclable, particularly polyester, um, in terms of when they end up in the global south. We did an investigation in Kenya and looking at what happens to kind of plastic clothing. Um, when it enters the global south, it's the same as plastic waste, essentially. Um, and also how it enables overproduction. It's the cheapest fiber group by far, and you can see a direct correlation between the rise of fast fashion and the growth of synthetic fibers. So this is something we're applying very, very heavy pressure to on the industry, because if you go after synthetic fibers, if you go after, um, if you go after fossil fuel-derived fibers, not to compare them to natural fibers or not to suggest that we're going to switch to natural fibers, but as a way of stemming overproduction. Um, I think it's an incredibly powerful lens through which to look at it. Anyone else want to answer? <laughs> I'm the moderator, I shouldn't be answering. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to jump in on the sort of growth and too much stuff question, because I'm just, I guess, personally very passionate about it. Um, and it kind of links back to the full solution. So one of the things that brands often put in their climate strategy, climate targets are intensity-based targets. So we want to reduce our emissions by 50%, um, and then in tiny little print at the bottom, it says uh, per item or per unit of value added or per dollar. Uh, this means that as brands continue to grow their business, which is the incentive under capitalism, um, their emissions can grow, um, but yet they get rewarded. So this is why I come back to sustainable materials not being enough because um, ultimately, you know, they can reduce the impact of uh, an item on its own, but with so many items, it's cancelled out. Um, so that's kind of the uncomfortable or inconvenient truth that we have in this supply chain is we could make 100% sustainable products, which we don't. We could make it from 100% renewable energy, which we don't. But even if we did, there would still be too much stuff and ultimately we're never gonna reduce our absolute impact unless we contract that as well. And obviously there's a consumer role to play, but my belief is that it comes from overproduction. Um, if, you know, the, there wouldn't be this false economy of buying such cheap stuff at such high volumes if we didn't have overproduction in the first place. So even just small little things on sustainability reports like intensity-based targets, I think are a real sign of um, the root cause of the problem, which is we have too much stuff. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's an I uncomfortable so. thing that we all have to think about is when we're talking about sustainable supply chains is what, what are we sustaining? Are we just sustaining more stuff? Yeah, exactly. Um, any other questions? Lady in blue here. Yeah, 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 sure. to keeping their costs relatively low because they don't have to reproduce the clothes and also 
reduce it, the volume while also meeting the demand for, or constructed demand for more pins. And, and what was your second, second part? Uh, my second question was related to the financing of this. Is there any, I might have missed this already, but is there any work with banks to encourage them to uh, structure their loans around this sort of, these, this value system? Um, that's my question. Great. <laughs> Who wants to take that? Um, on the first question, I think it's a lovely idea. Uh, I don't think it's anything that we've been working on, but it's really interesting. But I think that I'm more, um, in, in that kind of vein, focused on how, and this connects with the pay question, really, of um, if, fair, uh, if fair prices are paid for, for, for pieces and for, then I think that, that that in itself is a motivation for brands to ultimately produce less to focus on quality and to focus on more longer lasting styles. And that's kind of the outcome that, that I would like to see in, in that vein, if that kind of leans towards answering your question. And um, in terms of the bank loans, I mean, I think that this is something which brands are moving towards. Like I know that H&M, for example, is working, has a, an agreement with DBS, yes, around um, providing uh, bank loans. But I mean, I think, of course, like again, this question of, of kind of taking on debt is, and I'm sure that, that um, other people on a panel would, would want to speak to this more of, you know, is that, is that the solution that works for everyone? Um, and is it available to everyone is a really important um, part. So it may be part of the, the solution, but not all of it. I mean, I think from our perspective, I would like to see, um, potentially a, a fund made available that brands pay into based on potentially their, um, you know, their sourcing from different countries and, and have something which is ring fenced, it is potentially a blended financing arrangement that is more accessible and not necessarily debt based. Thanks, Rachel. We have three minutes left and time for probably one more question. Chap at the back caught my eye. <laughs> Um, but I do have um, a lot of relationships with a lot of other fibre producers as well. And it's been really interesting at this COP, uh, meeting with other producers and seeing, especially in developing countries, that all the challenges they're facing are very similar to ours. So we're producing about 10 to 15 tonnes of uh, wool a year, about 40 tonnes of uh, livestock production as well and uh, we're sequestering over 200 tonnes of CO2 a year on our property. So just a positive example of something that's being done. Um, the Italian pr uh, processors that buy our wool, they're doing a lot towards supporting us um, through small premiums. We've uh, been improving all the ethical and uh, animal welfare standards, so, such as the Australian One Sustainable Gold, or RWS, or ZQ, or um, Nativa, and um, it's been really important to us, the transparency of the supply chain. So we've got an open door policy on our property, and uh, people can see where our wool's coming from, and it, but it's been Im really important connecting through to designers, so we've got relationships now with, with big companies and also all couture designers, and educating them on how and where their wool's coming from, and uh, and bringing them onto farm. So, um, just in just the interest of time, what was the yeah. question? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to to ask, you know, uh, what is being done on in terms of measuring um, the 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 natural capital and uh, measuring the emissions at the production end? I'm part of a big project, so I'm really interested whether. That's being done. I'm interested in the biofuel side of things too, because we actually do a lot of agroforestry, which is right. One, sorry, one minute and twenty-two seconds. So whoever wants to answer this question, Thank you. <laughs> the measurement on farm is. is I'm, I'm wanting to know what's being done with the me measurement side of things and emissions. Um, Natural capital uh, measurement, I think, and, is the yeah, and emissions on farm by on producers. Got one minute, so 
we haven't done much with respect to the measuring of the emissions. We have done that in separate value chains, including coffee, where we are now able to tell how much is, is being generated. But when it comes to the textile and the fashion industry, that is yet to, we are yet to have a, a business case that actually works in terms of carbon emissions. But I think progressively this is something uh, that you're going to employ, seeing that it has worked in other value chains as well. I'll be sure to keep in, in touch. Big Thank you so much. We got, that is, we got this big red clock ticking down. I'm not sure if you can see it. I don't know what happens at the end of it. We fall through a trap door. But um, thank you so much for coming, everybody. We're going to stick around. So ask us any questions you like and enjoy the rest of COP. <laughs>